Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast, Episode 666. Heat Stroke. How to stay healthy in the heat. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about anti-aging medicine. Your host is Dr. Kathy Moffat, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging. Dr. Maupin is the author of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about testosterone replacement therapy for women, and Got Testosterone, the award-winning book for men that helps men choose the most effective and safe form of testosterone replacement. These books are available on Amazon or from Dr. Maupin's office at BioBalance Health in St. Louis and in Kansas City. Dr. Maupin's office is currently accepting new patients. Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast. I'm Dr. Kathy Maupin, and today I am dressed for working out because we're going to talk about exercise in the heat and heat stroke. 2024 has been one of the hottest summers that I can remember, and it has been causing many problems with people's activities, and many people have been going to the emergency room or have been suffering at home with the after effects of heat-related illnesses. Now, heat stroke is the most severe heat-related illness that you can have, and uh, it is something that uh, I want to, us to avoid. That, but you have to know what it is to avoid it. I've been present several times uh, in my history when I have been around people who have experienced heat stroke and I have had to give them first aid until we got help from the emergency services where we were where we were at this time. Usually it's outside. Usually it's after um, extraordinary exercise, but it doesn't even have to be that. If you're outside for a long time and you're hot and you're sweating and you're dehydrated and and you are not doing anything to prevent heat stroke, then you can suffer with this as well. So the most severe of all the heat-related illnesses is heat stroke. It can cause you to faint slash, slash collapse. Um, people who have heat stroke drop their blood pressure. They act out. They act kind of crazy. They kind of wander around and, and, and in the end, pass out. Um, they may even have seizures. This is, this is a severe emergency. Um, the first thing you should do is have someone call 911. But then you start emergency procedures to prevent this. And one of the things is to have the person lie down, elevate their legs, and if possible, move them to someplace cool if you are in a place wh where you can move them. Uh, if they passed out, they may not be movable. But elevate their legs and then place ice packs, hopefully you have ice packs, on their, around their neck going to their brain, under their armpits, and in their groin, so as close as you can get to their groin. And those are the air, those are the places where your blood flows closest to the surface, where it is going to pick up the coolness and then try to cool the whole body. Um, this is what you do, be, but you should have 911 on speed dial and have already called them to come help you uh, in this circumstance. Um, I've asked people who have been in this circumstance to drink water or to drink something with electrolytes in it, which is a great idea to help them get back faster uh, and to be healthier faster, but they don't want to drink. People with who have heat-related illnesses feel sick when they drink, but they need to drink and they need to rehydrate. So ideally, you would have water and water with electrolytes. And I use... I use either this electrolyte, these come in little packages uh, that you can carry with you when you're outside, or I, I always carry Noon, which is Noon Sport, which is an electrolyte uh, tablet you can put into a water bottle. This means you have to have these with you all the time, and you have to have water with you all the time in order to actually help someone or help yourself. Um, so heat stroke isn't just about heat. It's about heat and sweating and losing all of your electrolytes through your sweat. So that's why I, I am proposing that you always have water and electrolytes with you, especially when you're outside doing anything in the heat. Um, <clears throat> many people who start to feel like they're 
getting heat-related problems will feel like they can't sweat anymore. Their sweating stops. That's a bad sign and a sign that you need to go get cool and stop doing what you're doing right now. They also, some, uh, a victim of heat-related uh, illness will also feel maybe even chilled. Although it's hot outside, they're, they feel chilled. That's a really bad sign, and you need to get into the cool and do all of these things. Drink water, drink electrolytes, use ice packs, and try to prevent going to the hospital um, or going uh, on an ambulance to get IVs and to get a cooling blanket. They, there are all kinds of things that emergency services will take care of you with, but you need to be aware of it so that you don't just ignore it until you're so bad that you can't be treated or you, nobody around you knows what's happening and you just drop to the ground. You have to tell somebody that you're with what's going on with you too. Now, who's at, who's at risk for heat stroke? Well, the um, people over 65 don't tolerate heat as well as people who are under 65. It doesn't matter how good a shape you're in, how much you exercise every day, you're still not as you're still at risk or higher risk than somebody who's 40. Um, if you're on multiple medications, especially blood pressure medications and diuretics, that puts you at higher risk for heat stroke too. So you should always be aware of that, have water with you and electrolytes. If you are overweight, that makes heat stroke much more likely because you're insulated. Your, your, the fat is insulating your body and making you hotter internally. If you have anemia or other blood conditions, that's, that is also a risk factor. If you've ever had a heart attack, if you have atrial fib, if you have an arrhythmia, all of those are big risks for being out in the heat for very long. You should not do that. You should go inside every hour, drink electrolytes, and then wait till you're completely cool before you go back out in the heat. Um, if you are somebody, God forbid, who doesn't drink water, <laughs> uh, if you're just drinking caffeinated drinks, uh, you're going to be dehydrated when you go outside. And those, ca de those caffeinated drinks decrease both your electrolytes and your water, and you're at higher risk of getting heat stroke faster. If you've been outside, that the person that I'm thinking about was that last presented with heat stroke uh, when I was present was played golf all day and drank alcohol all day and was dehydrated and wasn't drinking water but was drinking alcohol, which makes this all the more difficult to treat. And then he was inside for a few hours. Then he went back out into the heat and he was drinking alcohol again. That puts you at huge risk of having severe heat stroke. So that's not recommended. Um, if you've just been flying, you're dehydrated to begin with. So consider that. You need to hydrate before you go outside in the heat. Uh, if you're hungover, you're dehydrated. So you also have to uh, consider that before going out in the heat. And um, <clears throat> if you've had nausea, vomiting, the flu, anything that has um, been dehydrating you from diarrhea or vomiting, then... That's, I don't think you should go out in the heat at all. You should wait a period of time to recover and rehydrate your body. Um, heat stroke is so bad that it can actually cause you to have a stroke. So the older you are, the poorer your vascular system, uh, the, the more um, aggressive your exercise, and the, and the more severe you allow it to get before you try any intervention, those all put you at risk for having a true stroke, which can leave you unable to do things. That's, you can be una unable to walk, talk. I mean, you, you really don't want that. It is so much better to prevent this than um, don't push yourself in the heat. So uh, if you have just an intervention, if you had somebody who passes out, and, and they start waking up and you're waiting for emergency services, then I would uh, use a washcloth with water. If they can't drink, just put that in their mouth to just see if you can get them to have a little bit of hydration. Um, that may be acceptable. Now, 
<clears throat> a little story here, personal story. We, um, that's why this is even more important than, um, than I can tell you. Uh, we were, we went with another couple to Italy to Cinque Terre, which is a, a series of five cities that are up on cliffs over the uh, Mediterranean Ocean. It's in Liguria, which is northwestern uh, Italy. And one of the things that you do there is to go on a hike between these towns. And the hike is on a very narrow path, dirt path, that is right over, like directly over the Mediterranean. So there's really no, there's no protective bars. There's, it's just a dirt path. So they tell you it's going to take a couple hours. It usually takes like four or five. Um, and you should start early in the day. So all of the best laid plans. We were going to start at 8.30. Um, the ferry we were going to go on to get there to start the hike closed that day for the wind. We had to take another form of transportation, which was the train, to get there. And so we didn't even get to the first town until 10.30. By then, we had, we had plenty of water, we had plenty of, of electrolytes, but we were drinking it on the way. We didn't refill our bottles of water. So we were, um, we, we should have been more wary of this. Um, we didn't have any other risk factors except being over 65, all of us. So, <laughs> and being on some diuretics possibly. So we get on this path and halfway through the path, maybe three hours into it, our water's gone. We've been sweating. It is top of, it is the height of the heat. It's in the 90s and that is very unusual for that area. Um, there are, there is tree covering us so that we're not in the direct sunlight all the time, but it is, it's a hard trek and you're going up and down stairs all the time and um, there are rock stairs, but they're stairs. And so it's not as easy as it looks on paper when you're reading the guidebook. And we got almost to our destination. We were probably 45 minutes out. And my husband starts talking funny and staggering. And he couldn't walk. And he was holding onto the, onto the wall. There's like a, a wall here and then a cliff down here. And I was afraid he was going to fall off the cliff. And so we are, we're trying to guide him to a place where he can lie down put his feet up, and he, he had not told us he was feeling bad or anything, but we were out of water. We still had electrolytes. We had a little bit of water, and um, I put two of the electrolyte tablets from the noon in just a little bit of water and had to argue with him to have him drink it because some, some people that passed by gave us some water. That was helpful, but he literally passed out. Now, we're in a place where there's no emergency services. They can't, nobody could come down this path and haul a six foot four, 225 or 30 pound man down a path. It's just not going to happen. So we're literally in the wilderness. People are offering to help us, but we can't move him. And all we could do was pray, hold his pulse. His pulse was thready and he had to rehydrate. He had to cool down. We put, um, some of the folks had cold water bottles we put under his arm and around his neck. And we just tried, we just sat there for 25 minutes waiting for him to like wake up and recover. And thankfully he did, obviously. So we, he, we slowed our pace and got to uh, Vernaza. Vernaza has a, a beach, a rock beach pretty much. And you just, you can just walk out into the water. He literally walked. <laughs> He was still hazy and kind of confused. He walked directly into the ocean, got cool that way, and then laid on the sand, sand slash rocks, until we had gotten something to drink and food for him. And, <laughs> and um, by then he looked homeless, <laughs> but he was alive, so it didn't really matter. And uh, we, were able, we were able to get home. He really was not better for an entire day after that. It took him that long to get rehydrated and to feel better, and thank you God he didn't have a stroke. So that's how bad it can be, even when you've thought about this and planned it. In your backpack, you've got all this water. Well, the water's gone fast, and water's heavy. That's why people don't 
take enough of it with them when they're hiking. So you have to think about that. It's worth hiking with a lot of water so that you don't run into this emergency. So, um, so let's go back and say, how do you feel when you're having, you're starting to have a heat-related illness? It may not be stroke yet, but you're starting to feel bad. You usually feel weak, feel like your muscles aren't as strong as they should be. You get out of breath. Uh, your pulse goes up. Um, you don't have to urinate, like for hours, um, and you stop sweating. So those are the signs. Out of breath, weakness, pulse rising, um, no need to urinate, and you stop sweating. You may even feel cold. As If you feel cold, you're really close to heat stroke, and you really are going to need some kind of uh, IV intervention and, and uh, a cooling blanket. If you're dizzy and unstable on your feet or acting out, uh, you're really close to vascular collapse. So I encourage you to look for these things and look for them in the loved ones that you're out uh, doing things with, even if you're just cutting the lawn. If it's 100 degrees and the humidity is up and you're out in the bright sun, you are ready to have them. I mean, you're setting yourself up for a multi-system life-threatening event. It's, it's not a joke. It's, it's really severe. And you can go, you can get heat-related swelling. You get, there's so many different kind of things that can go along with this depending on your own personal medical condition. You can get a heat rash. You can get cramps in your legs from lack of um, electrolytes. Let's talk about electrolytes for one more minute. Electrolytes, when, they, when you look for an electrolyte mixture, you don't want just potassium. Potassium is one of the electrolytes, but you need to have potassium, sodium, calcium, magnesium. You need to have trace elements that are all things that come out in your sweat. So whatever is going out in your sweat, you need to replace along with water. Otherwise, you're just going to be swollen. Without the electrolytes, you'll be swollen, but your vascular system won't keep the water in there. So it's very important to do that. It's very important to know when you're at risk or if you have illnesses like, I, I would feel like this because I had atrial fib for some years and I don't have it anymore. It's been treated. But if I played golf and it was 90 degrees, I might get through nine holes and then I'd start feeling weak and dehydrated. And even if I took water and electrolytes, I would have to go in someplace cool and stop. And I did. So that's all very, very important to be aware of your situation. I don't have to do that any longer, by the way. So um, in my blog, I have a list of medications that make you more at risk for heat stroke. I won't bore you with that currently, but you can look them up. Um, this is, I, I received this information or I uh, researched this information from the New England Journal of Medicine. And so these are things that you should look at. If you're taking these things, you're at higher risk for this happening. Um, for those of you who think you're tough and you're going to push through and continue to exercise through this, you could be risking your life. So don't do that. It's better to be moderate and think about it and give up whatever you're trying to do or stop and then come back and do it later. It's not... Nothing is so important that you can risk your life. So I hope this helps you get through this summer and next summer and whatever else you're um, in a very hot situation. And we're always trying to keep you healthy. Thank you for listening. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit BioBalanceHealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at Facebook.com slash BioBalanceHealth.